Uh, so Mark 9, uh, remember last week we talked, it was in Mark 8, and remember we just got done with the feeding of the 4,000, uh, the Pharisees were demanding a sign, uh, then Jesus jumped right into the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod and, and the Sadducees, and uh, then Jesus heals a blind man in Bethsaida. Um, and then uh, Peter, you know, was commended for for uh, being told by to, by God yeah. that and realizing that that uh, Jesus is the Christ. And Peter came out with that, and he was commended for it. But then Jesus starts talking about, uh, you know what, boys, I'm going to die. And then Peter pulls him to the side, and he said, "Hey, boss, uh, you need to stop talking about that." And Jesus flat out lays him out and uh, said, get behind me, Satan. So big swings for Peter last week, uh, emotionally, spiritually, the whole bit, but he's in learning mode right now. And he's going to continue to be in learning mode uh, for, for some time. But uh, let's start out with uh, verse one. And uh, Dad, you're immediately to my left. So if you would please read verse one, sir. <clears throat> verse one. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Wow. Sounds like a pretty big statement. And he's making a pretty big pretty bold statement he knows exactly what's coming we don't see it yet but but he does and so we jump quickly to verse verses two and three ned would you read those sure <clears throat> and after six days jesus took with him peter and james and john and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them just two and three, right? Just two and three. So this is uh, Mount Hebron, Mount, I'm sorry, Hermon, uh, where uh, it's thought that, that uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. And uh, so it's not just like a hill. Uh, this, is, this, this takes a hike to, to get up there, obviously. This isn't just a few minutes. This has put some gas in the car. We're going to travel for an hour uh, and get up this mountain kind of a thing. So um, I, I wanted you to see the magnitude of the mountain that they think they're talking about here, Mount Hermon. And stop the share. There we go. Um, so this directly fulfills what Jesus was just talking about in verse one. It was likely in, because, you know, it's going to set up for the transfiguration is what it's setting up. And so that's what Jesus was talking about. Some of you, well, some of you turns out to be Peter, James, and John. Um, it is likely in the fall and about six months prior to the Passover um, when Jesus would go to the cross. So again, we've got this accelerando, right? Yeah, there's that word, uh, that accelerating drum beat heading, heading toward the cross. Verse four through six, uh, Doug. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good that we are here? Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Okay. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Interesting moment. Uh, Moses uh, was on the earth, walked the earth 1,400 years prior to this event. Uh, he was the provider of the law. David came up to visit me today, and, and uh, David brought out, you know, while we were talking about this, that, that Moses was the lawgiver 
while Elijah was was the prophet. And so um, it's interesting that there's an argument about Moses' body. Um, and uh, this is all going to go into a logical progression here, so hang with me. But in Jude 9, uh, it says, But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil... Uh, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So there was an issue about the preservation of Moses' body. It must have been important for some reason. Then we've got Elijah, who appeared uh, and walked on the earth 800 years prior to this event. He was a major prophet, obviously, but he also did not die. Uh, in 2 Kings uh, 2, 11b, it says, And Elijah went up a whirlwind into heaven. So Elijah did not die. So very likely, these two, Moses and Elijah, uh, who will be uh, will be God's witnesses. So we look in Revelation. We're all over the place tonight. Sorry. So in Revelation 11.3, it says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Uh, there are two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth, and if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So, it's Moses and Elijah that appear with Jesus in the transfiguration. Their bodies were preserved. So it's likely, according to commentary, that these are the guys who will, who will be the witnesses in Revelation during the tribulation. And it's just kind of an interesting point. It's a little bit of a sidebar to tonight, but it's interesting. Um, David asked, uh, why not e Enoch? And um, remember, Enoch was taken up and not, and he didn't die as well. Um, but Enoch is more uh, used as a, a type of church. So if you're a premillennialist, anyway, uh, where the church is taken out before the tribulation, where Enoch was taken out before the flood, um, so yeah, those are the, those are the estimations. Those are the commentary on this particular section. Now we got to ask ourselves, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were talking. It doesn't say about what, does anybody have any commentary? Uh, do, do any of you theologians have any commentary as to what they were talking about? Mine makes a reference to Luke 9.31, okay. where it says, um, um, And behold, two, then we're talking with him, Moses and mm -hmm. Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, mm -hmm. which was about to, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That's a good reference right there. So that's pretty... That's good. Thank you, Doug. Hey, it's all in the book. <laughs> it's all in the book. It's all in the book. Spoke of his departure. I will need to add that to my notes. Good deal. Good stuff. Um, the other thing we can pull from this is that um, Peter recognized immediately who these guys were. Remember, Moses was alive 1,400 years earlier. Elijah was 800 years earlier. Uh, there's no way he could have seen a Kodak picture or a cell phone picture of these guys and what they looked like. He knew them immediately. 
which is kind of an indication that in heaven, in a transformed state, a uh, heavenly state, we're going to know people. We're going to know everybody. There's not going to be a question about who they are. So that's kind of neat. All right. Now, one thing for sure, we know that they were, that, uh, that uh, Peter was completely human because it says they were sore afraid. They just saw something that just wasn't supposed to happen. Yep. 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 And, and I love how it, it, I love how it said, and, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Like he's just trying to leave it to Peter to just try to fill the void of like, what in the world is happening? <laughs> he's trying to fill the awkward. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and he just starts rambling. Right, rambling. That's the word. Babbling and rambling. He didn't know what else to say. So I'm. I got to fill empty, empty space. So uh, some people are that way. Some people are that, are that way. See, mine, mine also says that um, Peter sees Jesus merely as someone similar to Moses and Elijah and wishes to raise tents as earthly habitations for heavenly bodies. Yeah. Yeah, didn't know what else to say. And it says perhaps it's it's perhaps because he wants to prolong the experience. Ah, well, there's a good argument. Okay, yeah, there's a good argument. I don't mean to go go back and forth, but uh, Doug mentioned Luke nine, and if you go back and read there, it says that Peter and those who were within were, were with him were heavily asleep. When they became awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with them. So apparently they were asleep, at least by mm. Luke's account. Yeah. Um, well, they just hiked up so Mount Hermon, like so they got to be sleepy. Up. I think they earned it. Can yeah. you imagine waking up to that, though? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Good reference. Uh, seven and eight, David. A cloud appeared, overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Hmm. When's the last time we recall God approving what Jesus was doing? Verbal. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That was the last time. So, which would at this point have to be two and a half years prior, something like that ish. All right. Verse nine and ten, dead. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept saying that, and they kept that saying with them, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. <laughs> Can you imagine seeing heavenly bodies? And then not being able to tell anybody about it. So you, you're the three special guys, and you're going to go back and talk to the nine. Can you imagine not saying anything? I mean, that's, that would just be, that would be hard. That's what y'all do up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can't talk about it. I'll tell you, you have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone would have believed them anyways until they'd actually seen Jesus rise from the dead. So they'd just be like, you guys uh, 
feeling okay there? Right. Yeah. What have you guys been smoking? Yeah. Mm. So well, see that that would that would have been what they would have had to fall back on. You wouldn't be it if we told you. Yeah, right, right. No doubt. No doubt. Um and the poor guys, you know, they're trying to figure out this thing. What does he mean by rising from the dead? Um, and he's spoken in metaphors, parables for so long. And he's speaking real plainly about the dead. And they're just not getting the gear change here. They're just not. Yeah, surely he's not talking about death. Okay, what does that really mean, you know? He's explained parables to us before. How do we apply this? They've got to be, you know, and they had a long hike, too, to get back to discuss that. But um, it's interesting that they just, they don't get it yet. Um, and they won't for quite some time to come, actually. A long time to come. Um, all right, you guys have switched, switched places on me. <laughs> so I'm... Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna change change up just a little bit. Doug, you're next <laughs> at this point. Okay. Um, Eleven through thirteen, and this is this part. This part's pretty hard. Um, I hope I can explain it. <laughs> and they asked him, "Why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come?" And he said to them. Elijah does not come or does come first to restore mm -hmm. all things and how it is written of the son of man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. Okay. Here's what the commentary said. Elijah's coming is in two phases. He's already come in the form of John the Baptist. So when John was born, Zechariah, the priest, said of him, this is the one who comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that was a quote from Malachi. Then in Malachi 4, the prophet Elijah will come in the end, day, end of days before the terrible day of the Lord. So it's, it's not that Elijah physically came. It's, it's somebody came in the, in the likeness of, in, in, the, um, uh, in the manner of, in the blessing of Elijah. So I still haven't grasped this fully. I think there's a lot more there. Um, still kind of, that's a, that's a work in progress there. It's kind of having, like in, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. It's kind of like with uh, in Luke when they talk about um, John the Baptist as he was developed in the womb. Mm. Even in the womb, he knew Mary had Jesus inside her. Mm -hmm. It just means he was filled with the Holy Spirit and had that close relationship on the same level as Elijah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Thank likeness you. of, yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's only, I think, two people I can remember that God said there will be no one like you, and that was King David and Solomon. Mm -hmm. Those two who said there would be no one like them, but he never said that about Elijah. Mm-hmm. I could buy that. I could buy that. Good. Good stuff. 14 through 16. Keep talking, David. It's your turn. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and scribes disrupt and excuse me, and scribes disputing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were amazed and ran to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing with them about? All right. So Jesus and the three finally made it back from the big mountain. And they're coming up on the rest of the disciples, the other nine. And um, 
The scribes have been arguing with them, no doubt pointing their fingers in their face because we're about to find out that they have had a failed attempt um, to do some healing and uh, that we'll talk about um, in excess here in just a minute. Um, so that's uh, at, at least it's a distraction. The guys are not questioned right away about what you guys did up on the mountain. They've got bigger issues to deal with uh, at the moment. So Ned is gone. Dad, we're wrapping back around to you to do 17 and 18. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whatsoever he taketh them, he teareth them, and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Okay. So that's the issue that the man has brought the son. Obviously, the man heard that the Jesus people uh, were there and he brought his son, but since Jesus wasn't there, okay, disciples, go ahead and give it a shot. Um, but they just flat weren't able to help help the son. In Matthew's account of the same instance, uh, it mentions that it wasn't just mute, but that he was epileptic. And um, so... We're going to have to ask ourselves, and we'll answer it, don't worry, but what is, at, at least at this time, is epilepsy a sign, sign of demon possession? Um, and so that's one thing that kind of was answered by some of the commentary, and it's a good question. Um, one fellow said, uh, demons do not always cause sickness. And so, for instance, recall when when Paul told Timothy to drink some wine for his many infirmities, so there's no infirmity demon. Uh, also, Paul left his uh, sick ministry partner, uh, Epaphroditus, in uh, uh, Miletus. And uh, Paul also himself had a thorn of the flesh left unhealed, so sickness does not indicate uh, demon possession. And I've heard people say that. Uh, that that it does, but obviously that's not the case. Um, but what is happening is in what could be looked at uh, as possible demon possession in somebody, and this is not common these days, not as common as it was when Jesus was, was here, uh, is that if they have self-harm, uh, so if they're doing self-harm, they may, that may be a symptom of demonic activity. So an example is this boy here. He was throwing himself in the fire and uh, into water. Um, and then we go back and we've already discussed the guy, the, the uh, demoniac in Mark 5, who was cutting himself. And then uh, you look at uh, Judas himself uh, after uh, he betrayed Christ, and he became possessed and he committed suicide. So that could be an indicator that there may be demon possession, that if someone is self-harming. And uh, so, uh, again, demonic possession or activity was extremely high during Jesus' ministry, but it's it was much less afterward. Uh, even in Acts, it was less. Uh, and it's certainly... Not, not now. Why was it so high then? Probably because the stakes were so high when Jesus was was uh, was walking the earth, likely. And so Satan was extremely busy. Uh, epilepsy is mentioned specifically uh, in a list indicating it's not demon possession per se. Matthew 24 uh, mentions epileptics and, uh, and demoniacs in the list. So it says, and the news about him spread throughout Syria. Uh, sorry, that's my granddaughter's name. Throughout Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill 
those suffering with various diseases and severe pain, demon possessed, people with epilepsy, and people who were paralyzed, and he healed them. So clearly, just because someone is epilept epileptic, they are not possessed. So, okay. Are we clear on that? So <laughs> there's some people have issues. So there's a difference between being demon possessed and sick. Yes. Huge, huge difference. So it's like being having COVID or just having the flu. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so hardcore COVID is demon possession. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, 19, and I, you guys switched her on Ned. Ned, read 19, please, sir. Sorry, I had, uh, I probably missed my turn. I had to step out for bedtime. That's okay. All right. Uh, what, what were my verses? 19. Just 19. And... Just 19. Just 19. Okay, I want to yeah. make sure. Mm -hmm. And he answered them, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. All right. So he seems a little frustrated. Uh, who's he talking to? It's probably the scribes who were starting the argument, who were had their fingers in the face of the disciples who couldn't do the job. Probably at the disciples for um, not having enough faith. And... Um, maybe a little bit at the father of, of the epileptic son uh, because he's he's doesn't have enough faith faith as well and you know this sounds almost rude um but recall that jesus came from where everything was perfect so he came from heaven and uh in order to save a people who are rebellious and continually fail even while they or we try try to do better we continually fail so this contrast is beyond what we could possibly imagine and he's tired at this point and it shows his humanity i struggled with for this for a little bit but it really shows his humanity uh, in the human jesus who identifies with us in our frustrations. And uh, why, why do we get frustrated? Think about that for just a minute. Why do we get and show frustration? When we just have a hard time understanding something. Okay. When we can't convince others when others don't understand something that we see so clearly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, when we know there's a better way and people aren't cooperating with that better way. And it is so frustrating. David smiled like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Could that also be considered when things aren't going the way we want it to be? Yeah, and the way we want them to be is always better than it is right the now. The right way. Yeah. It's the right way. Absolutely. And so I have been appreciate. there before. Huh? What? Never been there before. Never been there, different. yeah. Yeah. And so we can appreciate Jesus' position, showing the frustration even that, that almost appears rude right now, but he's frustrated because he knows it can be better and he's trying to make it better, but he's identifying with us in our frustration, even today. And so when we pray to him with our frustrations, you can kind of hear Jesus say the words, I know what you mean. I, I understand. I get this. And so I appreciate that it's, that it was shown here that Jesus got frustrated because he knew it could be better. 
Well, when I when I read it, it, it was too. It, it, it sounded it was the like right he way. was saying. It, it was kind of like he was saying, um, "Look, we're running out of time here." Yeah, yeah. The Accelerando was kicking up. Yeah, yeah. Well, early on, uh, well before this, he had sent his uh, disciples out two by two to do that very thing, and they did. Mm -hmm. So he had a right to be a little irritated because they just failed to follow through with enough faith to do their job. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys not learning this quick enough? I'm about, I'm about to leave. <laughs> I'm about to die, and I've told you several times. You got to get this. It's all up to you. 20 through 23, we are back to dad, I believe. Yeah. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming, and he asked his father, how long ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it is cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Go ahead and do 23. Oh, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Okay. And in, in my version, Jesus responded with, with almost a rhetorical go back to the father and say, because the father just said, if you can, and Jesus kind of repeated, if you can, all things are possible. <laughs> with, um, and so uh, in 20, the unclean spirit knew its time was short in the boy when it saw Jesus. Jesus didn't say a word and the unclean spirit started messing with the boy again um how long it had been there according to the dad since childhood which by saying that it indicates he was probably a young young man <coughs> maybe he's not he's no longer a child so maybe can we say 11 12 13 who knows but um old enough not to be falling into the fire and the water all the time um, 23, Jesus puts an exclama exclamation point on the fact that the belief is key. Got to believe. Uh, 24, Doug. Just 24? Just 24. Okay. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Well, this one verse, gentlemen, is one of the most impactful verses in, certainly in Mark, maybe in, in Scripture, because we've all struggled with unbelief sometimes. And uh, we keep hearing Jesus say, you got to believe, you got to believe, you got to believe. And, and, and you think to yourself, yeah, I believe. And then there's questions and doubts and things like that that come up. And I love this guy because he's so honest with himself and with Jesus face to face. I, face, I, I believe, help my unbelief. And that is just an honest, raw prayer asking the Lord to help me believe more, you know, and that I love that. I love that. It is so intense and so raw. And I, and Jesus responds well to it. I think it's, it's, it's just raw honesty from this guy. I love it. So I believe help my unbelief. 25 to 27, we are to David. 
When Jesus saw that a crowd was quickly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Then it came out, shrieking and throwing him into terrible convulsions. The boy became like a corpse, so that many said he's dead. But Jesus, taking him by the hand, raised him, and he stood up. Okay. Well, I've, I've read this many times, um, and not got the full meaning of this. This is a picture of um, a typism of Christ himself. And so this was, this was all a setup and um, made to be a type of the story of Christ. And so let's look in 25. Um, the command to never enter him. Um, I command you to never enter him again may refer to the statement Jesus said earlier about cleaning a house, um, showing it's possible for a spirit to return. <clears throat> this relates to when Jesus finished the job on the cross, uh, sin and death in the believer was not allowed to return. Um, let's see here. I'm going to explain this right here. In 25, uh, the, this is kind of kind of a long list of what happens in, in this little story. So keep the story in mind. Uh, the disciples couldn't help the boy, just like they couldn't stop the cross. So look at the boy as being Christ. The disciples saw the problem as insurmountable and had actually lost faith. So compared to how they would be between the crucifixion and the resurrection, when Jesus was crucified, boop, they scattered, they were gone, they lost faith. When Jesus approaches, Jesus is walking up, things actually get worse. The boy is convulsed and the spirit doesn't come out. So it's like Jesus came into the world, but things got worse for a while. You know, the, the demonic possessions and things like that. Things were going, going awry quickly. When Jesus commands the spirit to come out, it gets even worse. The boy is shaken worse, then falls down, making the people think he's dead. And so there's this dramatic pause. The boy is laying there lifeless for a time. And so this is, uh, it gives the impression that Jesus had failed. He killed the kid. That's what happened. That's what, what it looked like. He's died. He's dead. He's gone. And so this is like between the cross and the resurrection. It appeared that Jesus had failed. Jesus died. In 27, Jesus held out his hand and the boy arose. And so in the same way, God held out his hand and Jesus arose. So also in many times uh, in previous healings, Jesus would say, go and sin no more. But here's where the other point comes in. But this time the demon was told to leave and never come back. It's done. Jesus is the permanent victory over sin and death. Uh, the last thing is, this boy seems innocent, but yet suffered much. So in the same way, Jesus is innocently suffering the results of our sins. So there's a little deeper look into, into this story of the healing of, of the boy. I thought that was kind of neat, kind of interesting. Um. Also, it's kind of, kind of a Mark and Sandwich. 
just prior to this happening, Jesus had just talked to the guys and was talking about his suffering and dying. He has this interlude of the demon-possessed boy, and then it goes back, and the very next thing is going to talk, he's going to talk about is his suffering and dying. So it's kind of a Mark and Sandwich. And David, I don't know if you were with us before, but a Mark and Sandwich is where um, Mark is telling a story, stops that story for about a paragraph or so, tells another story that doesn't seem related, but it really is, and then goes back to the original story, and they call that a Mark and Sandwich. So now you're a theologian. You can get your certificate. I'll mail it to you next week. <laughs> <I'm forward to it. laughs> All right. Um, 28 and 29, and we are to, uh, we're to David. I just read the last one. Sorry. Thank you for keeping me straight, gentlemen. After you swap, I guess I get totally lost. Ned, would you read 28 and 29? And when he had entered into the house, uh, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. All right. So it's kind of too bad the boys didn't know that before they started, but I can't imagine trying to cast out a demon without prayer, but they didn't know that, I suppose. In some uh, manuscripts, it specifically says prayer and fasting. Um, but in the oldest, uh, most trusted manuscripts, there's two of them, uh, it just says prayer. So does that make too much of a difference? I, I don't think so. I unless you're casting out demons. So maybe not. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to land it here for this evening because we're coming up on the hour. Uh, and we will pick up next week at verse 30, where Jesus, again, we're getting on the other side of the market sandwich, and Jesus will talk about his death and resurrection. Mm -hmm.